Ushers, can you please help me? Can everybody be seated? We are so honored to have a wonderful speaker to be here. I'm going to take my time and read all this. Joyce Bauer Mukhtari is an excellent corporate maritime lawyer with over 20 years post-qualification experience. Joyce is a trailblazer who has achieved many firsts as a woman. She's a thought leader and a co-founder of the Rosa Foundation Africa. She has outstanding leadership qualities, a team lead by excellence, a public speaker and a communicator, a gender activist and a good governance, peace and security policy advocate. A senior lawyer of high repute who has specialized in international maritime transportation law and holds a certificate in maritime management and administration. She is a member of the Ghana Bar Association, the African Women's Lawyers Association, Women in International Shipping and Trade Association, member of the Chartered Institute of Logistics, Ghana, and alumnus of the U.S. International Vista Leadership Program. She's a proud product of three of Ghana's foremost senior high schools, the Wesley Girls High School, St. Francis Girls Secondary School, and Tamale Secondary School. An experienced mediator, she has mediated several cases, both locally and internationally. Joyce served as Ghana's Deputy Minister for Transport from May 2013 to January 2017. She was responsible for the formulation and dissemination of government's transportation policy for implementation by the 15th transport sector. Within the ministry, Joyce had oversight responsibilities of aviation, maritime and inland waterways, railways and road transport services. Joyce Mutari is currently a special aide and a spokesperson to John Dramani Mahama, a former president of the Republic of Ghana and a managing partner of the law firm Praetorium, if I'm right, Solicitors Ghana. Her hobbies include mentoring, reading, writing, traveling, I like that one, traveling and exercising. Joyce hails from Salaga and Bole, both in the new created Savannah region and formerly the northern region of Ghana. She's married and a mother of four i chose this woman because i personally have studied um, her life and i think that she's one of the most intelligent women of this soil i know every young person is going to be inspired by this woman please hear this ushers help me this ground floor is full now let everybody go to the next level because nobody should be distracted get your pen your notebooks ready because you are going to receive something that it will take you 20 years to recover with a standing ovation with an is welcome with a shout help me welcome the one and only choice Bow Hotel. Thank you very, very much. I only have one regret, that my dad didn't live long enough to be with us this morning. A very good morning to all of you. Touching, humbling, and a privilege to be of service. Please, have your seats. A few days ago, Pastor Eastwood said something very interesting something that resonated with almost everybody. He said, it is all about the spirit. And he advised everybody who didn't know where they came from, 
their parents' hometowns, their mothers, to go back home and honor them. There must be pride in where you come from because it's the only thing that determines where you're going. And I believe that the Bible, being one of the most read and widely publicized books, speaks very largely about the history of man and woman. And Pastor Brian, I'll disagree with you on this one. The men must also learn how to cook and cook very well. So that if you find that one sister who is not so good at it, at least the partner will be there to support you. Thank you very much. You know, it is not because you are a politician or because you are a lawyer or a doctor or whatever which says we are. It is also because along the way there are individuals who hold your hands and will help you along the line. Sometimes it may be your parent if you are lucky. Maybe your siblings, maybe relatives, maybe be schoolmates and friends. But there's one thing you should never ever forget. That there's a certain thing about God in all the things we do. The people we meet, the schools we go to, the friends we make, even the lives we lead, and the choice of professions. I'm one of those ones that a few years ago, you had to qualify in mathematics to read law here in Ghana. I sat the paper probably about twice or three times. And by the time I actually qualified and made the grade, I'd left the system and gone to the United Kingdom. There's another example who got the same grade but managed to make it, but in the end, didn't even read law. So there's something of God in all the things that happened to us one way or the other. It is therefore fantastic that we have individuals such as Pastor Brian, will bring all of us together to an event, a program of this kind. It is very, very rare that you find so many young people in one space. And I love the revolution happening in Ghana. There is a certain transformation with young people, all of our young people. We probably never had these opportunities to meet people like that who cared about what happened to us. Today, there are so many of these sessions creating impact and touching lives of many. Let's pray that the future of Ghana will be more bright and that our challenges better dealt with with the young crop of leaders that we are currently training who will probably be emerging soon. You know, there's a very wise saying that everybody has probably heard. And it says that if you do not know where you are coming from, you will probably not be able to get far in life. There's a scene that highlights the need for focus and purpose as key requirements for success in the journey of life. So in whatever you do, in however you do it, note that statement by Pastor Eastwood, go back to where you come from. Find out what your roots are. Give whatever support you can because the Bible says, honor your parents. So every child or son or daughter born of woman ought to learn to honor your parents first. For that is how you serve God. Focus means so many things to so many different people. It could be something about being direct, paying attention to something it is you want to do and do well. Having an interest or activity or even a talent. I mean, years ago, if somebody had told me that I'd probably post an outfit in a made in Ghana dress and have someone approach me and say, oh, I'd like to be part of your designers. I'd like to make clothes for you. It never even crossed my mind. Sometimes I post those photographs just because I think this is beautiful. So sometimes you'll be surprised the little things you do that impact and actually redirect the focus of one person or the other. So please, it is important that we focus on the things that matter. Only then can you yield the right and positive result that we all require. You ought to concentrate on the things that matter to you, the things that mean something to you. Because if you probably are not focused and you are distracted by so many things, it becomes very, very difficult for you to obtain or achieve your objectives. So please, my topic this morning is straightforward. It says, 
how to focus and achieve purpose in very trying circumstances. And we all know how difficult the last few years have been. So please, let's think about what the relationship is between our focus and our purpose. Your purpose in life may not necessarily be your focus. And your focus may not necessarily also be your purpose. It is why you find someone who trains as an engineer, a medical doctor, name it. Few years later, you meet them and they say, oh, I'm now a pastor. I'm in this church and I pastor this congregation. Maybe they were focused on becoming a medical doctor. But certainly, that was not their purpose. So eventually, they found their purpose and they tried to do something different. There are many people in this room who studied for different things, aspired to be all sorts of things, and find themselves doing the exact opposite. So it is important to have a certain dichotomy because your purpose will also determine what compass you use, whether it's a moral one, a social one, one of character, one of attitude, name it. However you want to see yourself, I believe that your focus defines the direction in which you'd like to see yourself over a stipulated time frame. It gives you a specific framework within which you make choices that lead you to the very best career that you can ever have. Purpose will also give you meaning to the life that you have and it will provide for you a sense of stability and continuity in changing circumstances. Sometimes your purpose and focus may not even come from your parents. It may not come from your friends or your family. It might even come from your teacher or somebody you met, a chance meeting, just a conversation. And it is why we also have to focus on what networks we build because that network will also determine your focus. It can redirect your path as you go along. It might even bring you into better focus. Some have roommates who change their lives, who build businesses with their roommates and friends. Some have done that with family members. So think very carefully about the relationship between focus and purpose because the two are almost mutually exclusive. It is only the purpose that can be lightened, for example, to your personal contract, your personal manifesto more or less, a promise you make, be it social, political, name it. It might even just be a talent, but you've made up your mind that this talent will take you places. And I watched Pastor Brian when he joined the choir, and I thought, wow, he sings as well. So yes, think about it. You can't be a fantastic man of God if you don't like to sing. Even if you don't have a good voice like mine, you'll have to make an effort and sing all you want. Well, I only sing in my room, even though at some point I was actually a choir even in church. Surprising that it never got me anywhere. So anyway, what we ought to do is to decide basically, as young people, who is it that you want to become? Who is your best example of the individual that you want to be? You know, there's one thing that has happened in Ghana over the years, where we've had so many young, youthful student leaders who have become very, very successful politicians. Where we had individuals who studied sciences, for example, who are today in the media and doing amazing things. We have lawyers who are serving in the media. And if you watch, Ghana's media landscape has become a hotbed, a bedrock of talent, skill set, like we never imagined. Most people don't even know when it happened because we woke up one day and there are all these professionals who studied journalism, media studies, name it. Some even started off just as basic what? Broadcasters. And today, let me remember my friend and brother, the late Komla Domo, who set apart a life of focus and a life of purpose. And in the short life he lived with us, the impact he left is profound, not just for his immediate family or his children, but for the BBC award for the best young African media personality. It resonates across the world. And this is what focus means, and that is what purpose does. My brothers and sisters, there are so many reasons why your focus and your purpose in life will always determine your future. When you decide, for example, as a young person, you know, to enroll for any course of study, the idea for you is that you just want a better future. But the question is, how do you intend to achieve this purpose? 
I'm happy that today we have a business mogul who will be speaking to us about how he arrived, not just at his purpose, but how he focused on the business enough to be here with us today. I'm happy today my husband and my younger sister, Clara, and my son, Camilla, are here with me. You know, my sister, Clara, took a huge risk. And sometimes I used to ask myself, where is this focus or purpose going? I look at her today, and she's my inspiration. Fills me with enormous pride what she's doing with IT and payment systems like no other. And it all just started because she decided I'm ditching law school and I'm doing something different. So sometimes your focus and your purpose might necessarily be aligned and eventually lead you to that exclusive club. Very unique. Probably something you never even anticipated or expected. I'm sure most often than not, our siblings don't know that they inspire us too. So for all the examples that I've always wanted to live, I think my proudest achievement has been in the nature of the siblings that I have. And I look forward that that same example probably will take us all to the next level. And I think it's important that we focus more on our purpose in this life and what, what satisfies us as a people. You know, it is also something that touches the lives of others. It might not be that you intended that your focus will make you money. I remember years ago in school, for example, they would teach you how to walk. And sometimes I tell people that even in Form 3, I was probably heavier than this. So recently I went to visit my former headmistress. She's 83. And on the labyrinth of all sorts of journeys, as soon as I walked in, she even remembered, you look slimmer. I laughed and I thought, oh, wow, that's interesting. So you'll be surprised the little things that people will remember about you. Sometimes it's just a life you touch, somebody you said hello to, a warm whisper, just hi, and then you walk past. There are even those people who have a certain overwavering support and focus. They probably don't even know where it's going to. And uh, sometimes I watch how Mr. Sandubu, in particular, a colleague of mine at work, how he has traversed politics, media, and enormous, enormous, enormous strides. It also teaches you the power of tolerance and patience. So even in your focus and purpose, you ought to remember that there will always be constraints. But you see, once you have a purpose and you are focused, it works and it will work very, very well. You know, let not financial constraints be the reason why you don't achieve your purpose in life. Sometimes you don't even need money. And I look at uh, Pastor Brian and what he's done with this IS in particular. And as he said himself, who wouldn't want to invest in something like this? If we were all asked even to donate something small to make this a success, I'm sure everybody would do so happily. Why do people find it so difficult to focus, especially this generation of you, and uh, a colleague of mine described it as a Generation Z, the millennials. And that's what I've told my friends many times over. These young people are one unique club of people. They are the same who voted for Sanders and for Biden and for all the older leaders we have. There must be something that attracts them to all these people. And I remember years ago when uh, President Mahama was first nominated as running mate to the late Professor John Evans Satter Mills. One of the things someone said to me was, oh, but he's too young. So it's little wonder then that our constitution actually said that for you to be able to stand as president in Ghana, you should at least be, what, 40 years old. And I'm delighted that today the young people are the same people agitating for us to take out that age constraint. So if there's a 21-year-old who inspires us all, to want him to be elected or she to be elected. Why not? They should be happy to put themselves up and have young people like you endorse and validate that ambition. There should be absolutely no barrier to any individual who wants to become a leader or to govern. We've seen amazing young people doing great things across the world. And today it is inspiring that in France, for example, they have a very young prime minister. In Canada, and everybody admires that young prime minister, in the UK presently, there are many Ghanaians who went to school with these individuals. So why not those Ghanaians? So yes, young people do have a stick. But if you're focused, if you're purposeful, if you're intentional, you will certainly be achieving all these things. 
You know, in as much as we have social media, and yes, I agree with Pastor Brian, please don't use it for all the wrong things that we use it for. It is not for the personal enhancing videos. It should not be for the twerking. And it certainly shouldn't be about personal aggrandizement. It should be more about the focus and the purpose you have for your life. So for example, if you know how to write and you write well, use your social media to propagate a certain positive energy. I have used that very well in law and in politics and it has served me beautifully. You no longer have to chase editors to publish your articles on sexual harassment. All you have to do is post it on your page and that's about it. So yes, let's remember that in the greatest of books ever, ever, ever written, in the greatest story, the reason why we have all the young, vibrant pastors and prophets that we have, all the great reverence that we look up to, there was a great man named Nehemiah. And in chapter 6 of that particular book, he faced so many distractions like we all do, day in, day out. And of course, we all anticipate that those distractions would prevent him from actually rebuilding the wall of Jerusalem. However, despite all these distractions, he was able to complete the rebuilding of the walls around Jerusalem in just 52 years. The distractions did not end. They didn't stop. They continued. In fact, the next one was a very personal one. And it was about a threat even to his personal self. But it still worked out. You know, in 2016, I remember I'd just taken a risk, left a very beautiful opportunity, a great job, a fantastic career, and come into politics as a deputy minister. I wondered what I'll be doing with myself in the next few years because I figured that, you know, I'd have to, you know, be intentional about how I wanted to conduct my life after the four year span in politics. Maybe I was very lucky enough to be selected at that time. Maybe there was a certain focus, a certain purpose, but I probably didn't even know it then. I look back on the last eight years, and as my brother Omani put it a few days ago, JB, you are one of those who has achieved enormously in opposition. It is about focus, and it's about purpose. It's learning to be versatile, but there's one commodity that money can never buy, character. I think every speaker here has mentioned that character, your attitude. You must be intentional about building character. And character can only be born out of discipline. And my sister is here. We were raised by kids who lived in the barracks. I mean, you wake up at five, you do the cleaning, you will cook. And I remember Clara breaking mommy's plates out of anger. The kind of beating she got is a subject of another story. So discipline is key. If you are focused and you have a purpose, discipline must accompany it. You look at the front row and see how the amazing ladies are sitting. It speaks to a certain discipline. It is not easy to sit in public. And you heard Pastor Brian about someone who came to him to be counseled. What impression do you think he took away from that individual? So I could easily pick out of all of you, those who have a certain focus, a certain purpose, even in how you sit, in how you walk, in how you relate to everybody. So please, my brothers and sisters, like Nehemiah, let's be encouraged that the temple is also for our protection. That we will respond to these distractions sometimes, and Pastor Eastwood spoke about it beautifully. Don't be waylaid by distractions. If it's for six months, please return to your focus. If it's for a year, please return to your focus. If it's even for 10 years, it's never too late to return. And yes, being single is not a bad thing. Use the time when you're single without responsibilities and use it wisely. It will serve you very well when you finally have to juggle. It is important that we note that Nehemiah said to himself that once he had decided purposefully to finish that war, he will do it. That the healthy 
distractions or boundaries would also keep him focused even more on the task because he saw them just as that distractions our youth today need very healthy boundaries because i think that is a real challenge that sense of entitlement that we all have you know let me share an interesting story years ago i was walking down the supreme court building and i used to go out those who like to walk between shiraj and the old court complex we probably don't remember that the court complex at the time was a really really strange looking building on one of these occasions as i was walking back somebody fell in step with me and said oh i watched you in court this morning and i'm i've just been made a ceo of the venture capital trust fund i would want you to come and work for me but you'd have to go through a certain process to cut a long story short i went for the first interview just as I walked in, I saw a gentleman who had been my parents' best man at their wedding. So I thought, oh, that's great. I won't mention his name. I'm sure this job will certainly be mine. Wrong. Two years ago, I found out that of all the two interviews that I participated in, he was the one to score me the least marks. And on each occasion, he gave me a 63. The individuals on the board who had never met me or even heard about me scored me 70 and above they sense my focus and my purpose but this one person that i repose enormous confidence in probably didn't even want me on that job and i am happy that today for whatever reasons he did all that my focus and purpose has set me apart that job i didn't even stay in it for long i mean i don't even know what i went there to do so we need to stay very, very true to ourselves and don't take it for granted. Not everybody is willing for you to be successful or happy when you succeed. Some will be, some will not. Even some siblings will not be happy for you to be successful. So don't think that when you walk into a room and find that cousin or brother or sister of yours, that they're automatically going to believe in you and give you that opportunity. They might not. So it is something that our young people must think about very carefully. You know, the most distinct characterization that I can think of is about the age that we give to people we consider youth. A few days ago on my way here, Auntie Bobia said to me, let's look very youthful. So I asked her, what does it mean to you look youthful? We are struggling now even to hold back the forces of gravity. So trying to look youthful is even a bigger challenge. So I thought, okay, let's see what youthful looks like. But please, when I arrived there, the sort of energy I saw in the room, I, there's no way I can master that level of, you know, youthfulness or energy. So, you know, age is a number, but actually, there are different levels of it. So, as Yaira reminded me this morning, mommy, you are about 30 years old than I am. So, we no longer qualify as youth. And the UN has said it. That the youth are those who are between the ages of 15 and 24. So my son here is part of your demographic. My nephews and nieces form part of that demographic. Some are even older than that demographic. The question is, how have we all in the ages of 15 to 24 started to focus and purpose for our future and for our lives? Is it just because we consider ourselves as good Christians, good Muslims, smart students, intelligent students, bright, and all of that? You know, there is something also in the, what you do with your years when you are younger. Even the schools make a difference. You know, I have a joke I tell about my challenges with mathematics and science. As far back as I can remember, we got a math teacher at some point who was German. I mean, she didn't even know how to communicate in English with us. She was a Catholic sister as well. So think about this. If you didn't do well, she would rather end up pampering you and thinking it was okay. My younger siblings don't have that problem. They are all actually solid mathematicians. And so I know that there must have been something in the way that I was taught mathematics that was different. In fact, our dad used to teach math at a certain point. So that should tell you that we didn't have any challenges with understanding arithmetic. But sometimes, how it is thought, how it is led, and what your own focus is, will determine what effort you put in 
And I think that as young people, wherever you find yourself, you ought to identify very quickly these challenges and potholes that might, like Nehemiah, serve as distractions for the course that you want to attain. You know, Ghanaians define the whole youth thing differently. And I believe that the African Union Charter says that young people are between the ages of 15 and 34. Now, my brothers and sisters, some very interesting statistics that I called from a speech that Muhammad delivered recently in the United States of America. In 2020, Africa's population under 35 represents almost a billion people. That is 22.7% of the world's total youth population, the second largest after Asia. Between now and the next 50 years, our youth are expected to grow by 181.4%. That's huge. So Africa alone has a youth equivalent twice to the entire population of Europe. Just imagine if all of us mustered courage, stood up with our focus and our purpose in these very difficult times. We'll be a huge force to reckon with. You know, even statisticians will tell you that Africa is blessed and will continuously be blessed for the simple reason that we have the largest population of vibrant and young people. How are we going to interpret, construct positively this great asset, this great demographic? Are we seeing it as a blessing? Would it be a curse? How exactly do we intend to utilize this great human resource? Nothing beats our numbers. Are we focused enough on the energy that this demographic has? The power to change things and do things differently. And a few days ago, a student of mine said to me, oh, but you know, madam, I just think that the old people refuse to give us a chance. And I thought, why should you wait for the old people to give you a chance? Charlie, there's a very interesting phrase we used to love when we were in law school, cap diem. Latin for seize the day. You have social media, you have the internet, nothing beats that. For the focus youth who have found value in this great asset, they've done amazing things. And you know, when you have a focus youth that has been graceful enough to be blessed with pastors such as Pastor Brian and his brother and the many other young amazing pastors we have or even older pastors who dedicate time to youth development and empowerment never take that for granted i think that these programs are actually building a certain revival in our young and ambitious but you can only realize these dreams if you're focused and you have a purpose so please one of the best things a focus youth can do is to build your capacity, discover your identity. Be very, very intentional about your calling and ask yourself what exactly it is that you want to do. You know, if you went into the service of God and it wasn't your calling, you will not be successful. If you even became a Roman Catholic priest or sister and it probably isn't your calling, you will not succeed. Clara is here. We had a headmistress who had tried to go to the convent. Eventually, she got married, had children, and became our headmistress. So it wasn't her calling. It took her to the best schools in the world, yes. But in her heart, she knew that she didn't want to be a Roman Catholic sister. So please, be very, very sure about your focus, your purpose, and your calling, especially in very uncertain and difficult times. You know, I looked at a verse, which is uh, Romans 12, verse 2. And it says very, very simply, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and absolutely perfect will. But you see, you will only realize this will 
if you make that positive commitment to be focused and to be purposeful. You know, a few years ago, when I started getting these very interesting invitations to participate in programs like this, I found it very awkward initially, because I thought, ah, you're a lawyer, you're a politician. You know, I'm known to be very, very vocal about my activism, especially for the girl child, and very passionate about it. I mean, in defense of all that, how does that translate into coming into a church and speaking to young people? I, did, I found it a bit difficult and interesting. I did it once, I did it twice, at the third time, and I thought, okay, we can still combine our very normal careers, our professions, with talking and promoting and motivating young people like you, without necessarily being a prophet or an apostle, or even a Roman Catholic priest or sister. So I have discovered that religion can also help us determine our focus. And coming from northern Ghana, where we have as many Christians as we have Muslims, a great and good Muslim fundamentally is the same as a great and good Christian anywhere in the world. And so when we have these conversations, let's remember that our faith, when it comes to the service of God, is simply the same rules. Be focused on your spiritual life. Be focused on your moral life. Be focused even on the purpose for your life. And you will find that wherever you find yourself, success will be yours. But yes, never conform to the ordinary. So yes, I would probably have been a lawyer. Maybe I'd have gone on to the Supreme Court because at the time that was what I imagined. I still remember the former Chief Justice meeting me after President Mahama had graciously nominated me as a Deputy Minister and said, oh, so you're back from Point Noir. How come you didn't come back? Because at these judges' seminars that I used to run, and actually, it is that platform that honed my public speaking skills. I started those seminars with amazing judges way ahead of me. And so once I got a compliment from a few of them, I knew this was something I could take and do very seriously. What I didn't expect is that I'll try and hone my speaking skills and that I'll come in to speak to a group. So this morning I was actually very nervous. And uh, even when I was trying to do the dressing, as I call it, I tried very hard to calm my nerves and uh, to be the very best that I can be. Because when I'm nervous, I'm even extremely more calm. And I think that is also not very helpful. So I had to achieve a certain balance. So can we create the required impact? The answer is yes. Can you create impact from wherever you come from? The answer is yes. Can you make that difference any day, even from behind that little table? The answer is yes. I think my father was the very first in his family to ever go to university. And he went to university very late. But he always told us one thing, the biggest value you can have is in your education and the quality of it. So you'll go to the best schools wherever those schools are, but know that I don't have a lot of money left after I've paid your fees to keep in the bank so you can take. I still think that that worked for us. We learned to be modest, to be humble, and to be very, very hardworking and dedicated. I think my biggest flaw is in my level of generosity. I tell my sister that in my young life, I've made some good money, but I've spent so much of it just trying to make sure that society is better than how we found it or how we intend to leave it. No matter how much money you have, what legacy you build, if that legacy didn't affect another life, it would be useless. If Nehemiah thought about building a wall around his house, that would be easy. It wouldn't take him 52 years. If he thought about just erecting a beautiful house and living in it all by himself and never touching anybody's life, that would be the same, useless. But imagine that you touched many lives, even by the intellectual property that you have. So you're a lawyer. And a colleague of mine told me a few months ago, JB, you have to stop these pro bono things. People call you all the time and ask you for all sorts of value things. You do it and you never ask for a dime. So this is what I do is that when someone reaches out to me, I ask my colleagues to speak to them. Because you know, I've lost that knack for even knowing how to build people. 
So when I get to check even sometimes, I think, oh, okay, then I'm surprised. But there are those lawyers I would reach out to and they would tell me, oh, senior, you know, if it's a divorce, she should be able to deposit at least 30%. The, the bar has a, a, you know, a regulation on fees. This is how much we should charge. And I ask myself sometimes, it is that legal aid case, that pro bono case, that will take you to the next level. You will be surprised that after you've done that thing for someone, the next few months, the next few weeks, they always remember to mention it to somebody. So never stop doing good, even when it has at your own detriment. And I think that young people today, maybe sometimes we are a bit too selfish. Maybe we need to learn to give off more. Titan is great, it's a fantastic way to give. But remember, there are many people outside of that bracket where we do tight. Some kids who need basic things. Recently, as we celebrated International Women's Day, PPAG reached out to me to advocate for free sanitary towels for young girls. If you are in an urban community, you will never understand. But you can talk to my 82-year-old mother who taught in the 50s, the 60s, through to the 70s. How many young girls stop school because they are in a period? Just imagine what that looks like for any young person in any society where you find yourself. Never take finding yourself in this room for granted. You know, the story of Joseph in the Bible is one of the greatest still where God used a 17-year-old to bring about change according to biblical history. And you'll find the story in Genesis 37 verse 2. At 17 years, and of course we remember many of these stories about Joseph facing enormous challenges. But he was not perturbed. He remained focused, he remained vigilant, he remained even honest. And he found favor eventually. Even that favor, he didn't take it for granted. So when my sister approached me a few weeks ago and said that Pastor Brian wanted your number, he wanted you to participate. You know, years ago, they had come to invite former President Mahama. I think it was in the Ashanti region that year. And our colleague, Honorable Ablakwa, actually went there to represent him. It was my very first encounter and I followed the conversation. I know my brother, Edem Agbana, participated in one of them as well. And he maintains that his life has never been the same. I was here last year and I participated in the Honorable Sam George's uh, segment. And I was very touched by how profound it was. And everybody knows that there's only one pastor that I call my brother and friend, and that is Reverend Isudanaba. A man whose life has probably been in mind since we were kids. And uh, I have sisters of mine who were actually in the, almost going to travel in that same vehicle in which Pastor Eastwood lost his kids. And I always tell him that God has a very, very interesting way. That sometimes, maybe at the time, I didn't even know that our paths were crossed again. But ever since, that relationship has been one of enormous, enormous, enormous inspiration to me. Not in the insights I gain, or in the conversations we have, but it's in the number of churches and church programs I've actually attended ever since. But it's also in the fact that we find there are so many young people who just need direction, guidance. Mentoring is a fantastic thing. And I had lunch a few days ago with the U.S. ambassador. And she said, you know, our government discovered you early. <laughs> I started laughing. Because even when I went on that program in 2008, I had no idea it was even important. I mean, go to 54 states in the United States of America, it's okay. It's a great opportunity, it's exciting, why not? But some of my greatest friends have remained the students I met on that trip. And I think it also brought to the fore this whole notion about how some leaders are not necessarily born. But 
that society can shape and build leadership, inculcate qualities of leadership into some individuals. But there are people who also identify someone with these skills but probably is not focused on them. You don't even think that you have them. And so when you meet someone after a job, after a task, after a presentation, anything, and the person comes back a second time, they ask you for even something else. They demand your attendance or participation somewhere else. Tells you that whatever you did and how you did it, it must have made a difference and mattered to somebody. You know, my brothers and sisters, despite everything that Joseph suffered, he remained impactful, even in prison. And eventually he found favor. So please, never give up on your dreams, no matter how long, how far, how difficult. Remain focused. You will suffer betrayal any day and time. That is a given. You will be tempted many more times. You might even receive a lot of bad press. And uh, for the few women who venture into politics in particular, no human being will be more scrutinized than a woman who comes into politics for good, for bad, whatever. The sorts of, uh, the litmus test for a female in public service or office is that you ought to be perfect in the eyes of all those who judge you. That you remember that not the same test is given to the men folk. So you don't know whether it's easier to be born a woman or to be born a man. But there's one thing that is emerging that no matter how successful a woman can or will eventually be, you will need the men folk also to support you in that endeavor. So we ought to start to see it more as a partnership. If you're focused, if you are, you've determined your purpose, I'm sure that all of these examples will work well for you. You know, there are very, very interesting stories about young people who change the world. I remember years ago receiving medical attention in uh, Jerusalem at a hospital called Hadassah. And uh, I met a very interesting young man. And then when he left, they said, oh, you know, these are the guys who build the ways. What we all call Google Maps today is what changed the story of their university. Today, across the world, turning on your sat nav is the best thing that happened in this world. So you find that in Africa, all we are doing is reinventing the wheels of relabeling, renumbering, name it. But these two young people changed the course of their university's life for good. And the government of Israel received huge sums of money for that patent. There are many of these stories across the world. I mean, we all use Facebook now, Meta. How did that happen? It tells you what young people can achieve even for their home states and for their countries, if we are committed. 17 is not that young, because we remember the story of Joseph. So to think that a 17-year-old received the Nobel Prize for education, being the youngest ever, because she survived the Taliban. Today, she's in a voice for everything that women and children advocate for. We have the story of our own Yaa Santwa, of a woman who lived way before her time and what she achieved, battle ready. We have the story of Joan of Arc, a French heroine. And it's one of the stories my father loved to tell and why he was always so proud of his daughters, even though everybody thought that it was best to have so many more boys than girls. But it tells you a story also about how children can turn out if parents believe in them, if the leaders they have believe in them, if they offer them the opportunities. Because of course, if you have focus and have purpose and it's misdirected, it will probably be of no use to you. Mentorship is good. Coaching is great. Look for the right example. The right mentor or coach. Especially for you, the young girls. 
Be very, very careful about whoever you pick out as a mentor or your coach. There's nothing wrong with mentoring. Many people have done fantastic with young people across the world. It didn't start today and it won't end today. But please be very intentional. Like you choose your choice of church, pastor, counselor, name it, or the music that you love, or your best dish. Be very careful about the type of person who you want to consider as an example. We have the story of all these young people and what they achieved. And today, may I pay glowing tribute to the late Professor John Evans Tamils, who became the Doctor of Laws at the age of 21. A feat that I believe only Mr. Chachuchikata has been able to repeat. So as we go along, may we remember always that the Bible remains an unfailing resource and a compass for many of us. But let this also be your very, very, very important guide. I took it from Hebrews 12 verses 1 to 2. And he reads, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on the Lord, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scoring his shame, and yet sat down at the right hand of the throne. It is imperative for you to stay focused, to achieve your objective. And finally, my brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things only. Philippians 4 verse 8. So please, I thank you all so much for your time. I thank my wonderful husband for being here with me today. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Madam Joyce Mutari. You can't leave yet. Uh, we want to ask just about two questions because obviously there are some people out there who have questions. So just two questions. Opportunity for two people to ask your questions. Today is an exceptional day. So yes, please, uh, gentlemen, can he ask the microphone, please? Okay, so two people ready. Microphone? Oh, let me come to you. Okay, good. Your name and your question, please. Please, I'm um, James. My question is, I think in his presentation, he made mention of mentoring. So how do I discover a mentor? Thank you. Right. I think that's very, very straightforward. I'm sure you saw Pastor Brian introduce a young lady to someone who has made mentoring a part-time responsibility so there are many people like that even in this room speak to any of them and i'm sure you'll find someone worthy of your time and effort thank you thank you second question right okay my name is yaira and my please my question is when it comes to mentorship and you you identify the person you want to be mentored under what are the some of the qualities you the mentee have to portray in order to be mentored by the person thank you that's why it's simple be genuine be sincere be intentional you see i have had many of these experiences you don't want the mentee who comes in the morning by tuesday she wants to imbibe you. It means she's not coming to be mentored. Or the one who wants to pry so much in your privacy and then go outside and share with other people. Or one who comes into your space and all they want to do is to compete with you. I think you ought to know why 
you actually want to be mentored and that will determine the success of that relationship thank you thank you so much madam joyce bawa Mutari. she deserves a standing ovation ladies and gentlemen let's do it better for her and of course we've been inspired today by her words and mostly what she said was we